All right, uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started. And uh, today's talk uh, will be live broadcast. We have uh, two students that will be taking Twitter and live chat. Uh, we have Camil Camilla and C over there in the corner um, uh, taking questions uh, from the virtual audience. I'd like to thank Dr. Settles for being here. It's an honor that uh, you accepted our invitation. Uh, thank you so much. And Dr. Dan Berg will be introducing you. Thank you very much. It's uh, my real pleasure to introduce a champion in the field, Dr. Stan Settles, who's now Professor Emeritus at USC. Uh, he served there as department chair of the Daniel J. Epstein Industrial and Systems Engineering Department and held the IBM chair in engineering management. Prior to that, he, he had an illustrious uh, career in industry, having worked at Honeywell in a jet engine business at Phoenix. Also, he spent several years at both NSF and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And he's a person who really started at the drawing board. Those of you who know what a drawing board is. And left uh, industry as vice president of manufacturing. He's a fellow, past president of the Institute of Industrial Engineers. Uh, he received their highest award, the Frank and Lillian Gilbreth Industrial Engineering Award. <clears throat> Elected to National Academy in 1991, fellow of INFORMS. Today we're very pleased to hear his talk on systems engineering at 263 miles per hour. Dr. Settles. Okay, is that mic working? Not working now, so it just fell on the floor. Okay, is that mic working? Okay, is that working? Got it, okay, very good. Okay, let's, ha let's have some fun. Let's go racing. And uh, a lo lot of people see that chart and they think, well, he must be talking about airplanes go that fast. No, you must be talking about ancient history when, when somebody did that, it was on, on the ground. Well, well. We're giving feedback. People getting feedback from the other room. They're going to turn off the mic in the other room. Oh, I see. Okay. It, uh, this picture gives you a quick overview on what it's like racing on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Yeah, there it works. Okay. This shows, here's my race car, and there's the parachute. Those aren't supposed to be facing each other. You got the basics? You really stop with a parachute. Brakes are incidental. You can stop without brakes, and I've done it at over 200 miles an hour. But the par parachute, whoops. Okay. Okay. Some somebody's playing it back over there. Okay. So so anyway, this this gives you an idea. Here's some of the, some of the things that are you may not expect. What is that sur surface? Salt. It, it's salt flats. It's not dirt. Everybody thinks, well, you kick up dust when you go out there and race. You don't. It's salt. And. We'll talk a little bit about the nuances of salt and racing on it. It's a great surface for land speed racing because it's cool. Even, even though the air temperatures may be up as high as 100 degrees, the salt is still cool to the touch. So that tires like that, to be blunt about it. Anyway, this, yeah, this was, again, not ancient history. I was in there at 
That was 2010. So that, it, and it, that's, that's the nature of it. You can do that. How in the world did I get into this? You, mild manner professor, uh, you doing that? Well, here, those of you that are kind of undergrads and all, you'd, you'd kind of recognize about that age group. I had a dragster back in 61, uh, and I actually built this, this car. And, and while I was a student, uh, going through, raced, race didn't go very fast. I have a street Corvette that would go almost that fast now, but uh, that was, again, I got, got out of it in 1961. That was my first involvement. Then in 1958, 9, and 60, I went to the Bonneville Salt Flats. This was not my car, but I, one year in 1960, we put my engine out of my dragster that I just showed you. We put it in this guy's car. This was a, a phenomenal deal. This guy built, actually built that car from scratch in his, his basement in Denver, Denver, Colorado. He had an Oldsmobile engine in it, but I had a bigger engine. So I, I drove it, and I only went 193 miles an hour. First time I'd ever driven the car, and the rules were different in those days. And the engine wasn't running right, but it still got, went that fast. So that, that gives you an idea what the salt flats are like. And this is called a streamliner because you can see you can streamline around the wheels. So we'll talk a little bit about what the cl classes are. And so s snapshot, they, they already ran through, through all this stuff. But what I, re reason I put it up there is to just tell you what, I, I raced there 58, 9, and 60, was involved in it, had a dragster back in those days. And then th there was a minor interruption while well, I did, did a bunch of this stuff. And 2007 was the next time I ra raced. So 47 years in between when I raced at Bonneville. And pe so people think, oh, well, you knew all these guys in, in between. No, I didn't. But I knew a bunch of them back in uh, there. Some of you, have any of you seen the movie The World's Fastest Indian? Motorcycle, it's an Indian motorcycle guy from New Zealand. He was racing back when I was there. I, I met him, but the guy that was my crew chief knew him real well. So it, it, was, it was kind of a fun time. But uh, again, my, my proud title is Professor Emeritus. I have business cards here that are kind of fun if you want, want they have a picture of the car on them. Okay, so I, I started November 2006. I got around some, a couple guys my age. We were happy to be at a gathering in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and my wife and I were there, and I got, these two guys were roughly my age, and they were talking about going to Bonneville. So this was 2006. At this point, I'd been married to this young lady for 45 years, and she, she knew me clear back. We knew her from the time she was about 12 years old, but anyway, when, when I had the dragster and all, we had an agreement. As soon as we had, had kids on the way, a, a kid on the way, one at a time, that, that I wouldn't race. I held to that. And, and I, tried, I tried to just, we introduced all of them to, to racing. Not, we raised four sons and none of them really at that time bought into it. If they would have bought into it, we, I'd have jumped in with them obviously. But we, we very carefully did, didn't direct them. They're, they're all over the map and the things they do. But anyway, here, here, here's a little bit of the idea. And I'm writing this in terms of systems engineering and what, what do you work to? Well, your specs, you know, and I'll talk about how we use it as a, a learning experience. Land t speed type race car, uh, really built for the Bonneville Salt Flats, and you just go straight, one car at a time, they're not, 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 not any of this loop-de-loop -loop thing, and it's not NASCAR bumper cars or whatever. Uh, it, and I've never, never raced in those. I had my engine in a car one time they, they did with stock cars in the old days. Okay. Dream was to be in the 200 mile an hour club. There's specifics for that, but I wanted to at least go 200 miles an hour. That's kind of a magic number out there. And I'd gone only what? 193. 193. Very, very good. You're coming right along. You, you're used to exams and questions. That, I, I like that. Okay, so I said, well, my goal is to go at least 200, but I recognized, again, in systems engineering terms, the requirements might creep up. They almost always do. But again, the industry I was in, they talk about, okay, we're going to have this and this and that. And that was the specs you bid to it. And if they'd ever kept any of our bids in that company to the actual, what they specified to start with, we'd have never made money. We had a clause in there that was clause 33 that one guy very clever, cleverly had in our, our contract that says, 
okay, you, you, make, you make a change in those requirements, the whole contract is subject to renegotiation. Ooh, they say, well, we, we want to come in, we want to make a change. So we say, well, come on in. And, uh, <laughs> so re requirements keep happens. Simple question, as soon as you invented the automobile, uh, how fast will it go? What, what was the first comparison? Pardon? Uh, yeah, a, a horse, horse and buggy, exactly. Well, the first ones wouldn't, couldn't outrun a horse. It's hard to imagine now, but that, that was that was a, a real milestone. Well, we we got past horses pretty pretty quickly, but, but what we're doing here is one car at a time, straight line course. I have up up to five miles to to get to speed. We'll talk a little bit about the variability in that. Ah, bottom line here: salt behaves differently than pavement. It's somewhere between uh, it's an exaggeration between between pavement and uh, it's it's like. You've, you've had a rainstorm and it's still, it's dry to the eye, but it's got a film on there and you can slide the tires pretty easily. That's about what it's like driving on Bonneville salt flats. So you, everybody thinks, boy, you've got a lot of G's accelerating. If you do, you'll spin the tires. And if you spin the tires, do you think they're gonna spin exactly the same? No, one will grip more than the other. You will immediately spin the car. Fortunately, you spin it, you don't roll them, typically. And we've done, done that a few times, we'll talk about that. But some, somewhere between, oops, there we got it. So, uh, starting out, I started in 2006, I said, well, what, how do I want it? I'm architecting it, the systems architecting. There's over 100 classes of cars that have achieved the 200 mile an hour level at Bonneville. All kinds of classes and classes of engines and I ruled out motorcycles. I'm, I was never that crazy. I, that was one of the smartest things I did is I didn't buy a motorcycle was that when I was in undergraduate school. Uh, and uh, I didn't, didn't fit that row. So how do you narrow those down? Well, you, it, it, you can't, again, in a totally exhaustive search to look at every alternative, you can't do that. So you have to start using what we call heuristics in system architecting to narrow it down. So th that's what I did. So I said, well, there's really three kinds uh, of vehicles involved. Primary interest was streamline, streamliner. Remember that yellow car? You could streamline around the wheels. Uh, that, that's the rule there. Those, are, those go the fastest. They also cost a lot more money. Uh, Lakester is open wheel. You can't streamline around. So that car, picture you saw in my car uh, had the wheels out. And about 13% of the uh, aerodynamic drag of the whole car comes from those wheels being exposed. And you can't, you can't basically do anything about that, but, but it's a whole lot cheaper. Yeah, it was look, looking for cheap. I, this, this doesn't have any prize money involved in it. It's not like NASCAR and all these deals that you make, make money. You can get rich with a race car. You, you know how you do that? You start richer. You start very rich. You got it. <laughs> yeah. And so this, this is all for fun. The top, top speed gets a big trophy about four feet high and gets $5,000. The cars that run for that, it cost them about ten to $15,000 per run down the salt. So you don't make much money on that. You don't make up for it in volume. Uh, okay, others, event, possible interest, modified roadsters, rear engine, modified roadsters. So I, I, I nah, could, could go with those. Uh, I won't even go into the definition of that because my interest has always been kind of the primary cars that are built for, for racing. Uh, uh, just my nature. So I said, well, I'm the client in this case. That's what I'm going to do. Not of interest coupes and roads, other roadsters and such. What wasn't interested in con converting my Corvette to a, be a Bonneville car. Okay, so you start looking at it. There are 12 classes all the way from 30 cubic inches up to unlimited, and uh, it gives you the cubic inches and uh, metric numbers. You gotta make a decision on fuels. Hmm. Well, Quite, quite different. If gasoline, you have to use the gasoline that's provided out there, and it's racing gas. So you say, what octane? Well, they don't like the word octane because anything over 100 is not, not considered really octane. That's a, well, it's a measure between 90 and 100, but it's equivalent to somewhere like 117, 119, something like that. And it's not to put out more power, it's just so you can advance the spark more, and, uh, but the gasoline itself doesn't pr provide more. Then you can go to fuel. Once you say you're in fuel, you can, one, one guy says you can put nail polish in it. He doesn't care what you run. The, the, 
so uh, the methanol, nice, nice fuel, burns cool, so on, but you're, doesn't put out much more power than gasoline. Then you get into nitromethane, and it puts out big power. It's an interesting, interesting material. I haven't done it, but you, people have t told me they have done it. Is a puddle of it will be on the ground. You can toss a match into it, and it won't light it. But you can put a drop of it on an anvil and hit it with a hammer, and it'll explode. So it, it's a really an interesting material. It also costs. Uh, last I, I heard, it costs uh, something like uh, fifty or sixty dollars a gallon to buy, and you break engines a lot. And then popular ones now, diesel became very popular. Diesel have gone over three hundred miles an hour out there, again with a minor investment of, uh, by the uh, English government. We're always competing with the, the Brits. They they've been in land speed racing, and the government su supports them. They don't do that here. So they've had a diesel. Electric power, anybody heard of Ohio State University? They have, they've had a series of cars called the Buckeye Bullets. And students really build these cars, they don't drive. The only thing they don't do is don't drive. There's a professional driver that drives them for obvious reasons. But they've had three different configurations of electric cars that have gone over 300 miles an hour. And they, they run kind of separate from there. The, the one is a hydrogen, hydrogen uh, Type, type battery and all uh, fuel cell and everybody's afraid of what that do so they they wouldn't even let them pit anywhere near us but they, they typically would sign up separately but three different versions have gone over 300 miles an hour and I visited them up there in Columbus and the, the first one had 43,000 D cell batteries in it <laughs> and, and, and the big, big problem there was if you try to set an official record that they were trying for it yeah, you have to make two passes. Those, those batteries didn't didn't have enough life to, to do that. But they went over 300 miles an hour with that. Then they had a second version that was uh, uh, some form of the hydrogen fuel cell, and the last ones had had the big, great big batteries that were about four feet square, all built into the car. But they had two of them rather than one. And I bet you can't get. I couldn't guess. I said, why in the world do you have two batteries? You, well, we need. First off, you only have enough charge to go one way, and then you have to be able to make a return run w within le less than an hour going the opposite direction. So they needed that battery life. But the real reason, you could change the battery out. The real reason was our rules are that as long as that, those batteries were in the car, you could transport it there. If they weren't in the car, then they were hazardous material, so you couldn't. That, that was not not immediately obvious, but the kind of thing you faced. But, um, okay, then you, you look at, uh, anybody have a turbo type car now? They're pretty common? Yeah, uh, yeah, D my Dodge Diesel has really a lot of power you put out in those. Uh, and supercharging d does the same, but again, you're in a different class then. So you, everybody that's running that class, well, not supercharged, unblown. So. Uh, other considerations. Again, these are the specifications. If you're doing system engineering, you're, you're, you got specs that you're trying to, to meet there. Very strict safety rules. Uh, every time you run, you have to go through a very strict inspection, and there's life limits on every, everything in there, the, particularly the seat belts and the fire extinguisher models. Even if you don't run, you have to get those recertified. The fire extinguishers every, every two years, and the, the seat belts and all that harness every five years. So, so even though you, you don't run, okay. A driver suit and helmet have to, obviously that's not a trivial deal. Roll cage structure that you're really strapped in and you think, you think you're think you in a seat belt when you're in a car. When you get into one of these, you, you're in so tight, you think, gee, I can hardly breathe. And they say, well, take a deep, deep breath and we'll pull it tighter. And, and that's really your friend, though. We, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that happened. Uh, the roll cage structure, clearly they inspect redundant parachutes. I'm in a class that's high enough I have to have two parachutes in there. It only takes one to stop, but it's kind of nice to have a backup in case it doesn't. And redundant fire suppression system. A again, we have bottles that are in there. that are both one for the engine and one for the driver compartment. And they're in nature that once you hit them, it, 
the whole thing empties out. Fortunately, I've never had to do that. But we're prepared if you do, because it really makes a mess when you do, but that's better than being burning. And there's all kinds of other rules we can go into. But these are the kind of the system engineering specs that, that go into that. Okay, ecological rules on the salt flats. That's a very fragile area, and we have competing interests. There's a intrepid mining has, mines salt, and you might think, well, well that's just for my t salt shaker. No. Uh, the, the, mainly for other chemicals that are in there, uh, have all kinds of other uses. Well, they, they, they take out what they want and th th we return it to the salt flat. It's not the same quality. It's, so that, they, they, they say, we don't, we don't mess with this raising stuff. We've got a business to run. Uh, and of course, you've got BLM that runs it, the federal government. And they're here to help you like most federal agencies. They, they say, we ought to leave this pristine and uh, preserve it, do nothing on it. And the racers are saying, what do you mean? This is the best place in the world to run. Well, unless you go down, go down to Lake Gardner in Australia and that doesn't look very easy. Okay, so <clears throat> we have to deal with that and how, how to do that and all kinds of things we go through that. You have, have to license for various speeds. First, first run can't be over 150 miles an hour. First time I ever drove the car was 137 miles an hour. And uh, that sounds fast. And on the street, that's absolutely insane. Because you've got other, other people and you've got streets that aren't, aren't really built for that. But it, we did, and we, I'll talk to, about the steps there. But you have to take steps up into where you, eventually you can have a license that's unlimited. And I, I'm the next level now, does a, a double A license. I'm licensed to 300, but if I, if I do a little run that's a little over 300, that qualifies me for the unlimited. But I don't think that car will ever do that. It's not a problem. I've lived the last 21 years up until just the end of this past year, lived in two places, California, Arizona. Where, where was I going to build a car? Okay. I didn't have, have a car. This was, again, just starting out in 2006. Got a transport to El Mirage or, or Mono. El Mirage is a dry lake in uh, Southern California. Get it. These, these won't fit on the, go on the street. It only clears the ground by about a half an inch. Just getting it in and out of a trailer is a, a challenge. Okay, so you gotta figure that. And then ec economic considerations, I, I set budgets, but they, I may not have met them. My wife still doesn't know what it all costs. It's just, she's she <laughs> been a good sport about it. There are all, all kinds of other things that go into it. And this is a very simple form of racing. It's about as simple as you can get. Just going straight, not, not, not competing, not, and so on. Oops. There we go. Okay. So on an appropriate date in 2007, April Fool's Day, I, I, I located a, an existing lake, lakester for sale. So I decided, well, I'm going to purchase that. I recognize it's, it, it's not what I want to end up with, but it was a way to get there uh, quickly. And so, okay, so I could start hopefully run it even at El Mirage a little bit earlier. And, and Bonneville runs in late August is when, when you run Speed Week. I, I said, well, a test vehicle. Com it was a complete car, supposedly a, a complete engine. Uh, it was really a collection of junk that the guy had as an uh, engine. And, well, uh, so we worked out, you have a phased purchase plan, right? You, so here, here's what it looked like, uh, blue and gold colors. And if you're familiar with the LA area, those are the colors that would be most associated with UCLA. And if you think a USC professor uh, could, would, would be seen with that, you had, had to change that. And this is, this is the gentleman I, I bought it from right here. But it, it, so I, I, I bought it and we, we set about changing it. Um, so it was just to get back to the specs a-class Lakester had to have the wheels exposed, 468 cubic inch displacement Chevy, unblown, running gas, really a pretty low-tech tech engine. So made their down payment April 1st. Uh, we're, the plan was that we'd run it at El Mirage with, with his engine in it. He, he thought he could, could break the record. The car still holds the record for that, that class at El Mirage, 223 miles an hour. And it's a shorter course than Bonneville, so he was going to have his guy drive it, and that was that was a test to buy out the buy off the chassis and everything. 
Uh, it, it it didn't it didn't run right, uh, but it, we did run it that day. I said, okay, we'll I'm gonna make it make that. Then June 10th was a race. We were gonna put my engine, what was to be my engine, in there, and the final bailout would be had. Well, uh, the, the May May 5th, the en engine started on that. And this is what happened with his engine. Uh, Talk about simple systems questions. It wouldn't run right. Couldn't did all this kind of analysis of the fuel and everything. The ground wire on the ignition wasn't tight. And and this is the way with a system. You can have everything working, but one little bit, and even ones that spend hundreds of millions of dollars have the same thing happen. Kind of thing happen. But later, simple ignition problem. Uh, made the progress payment, agreed to put my engine in for June. As we were assembling it, we got into the, found a, a big whoops. The crankshaft wasn't good. If you know anything about engines, that's the, the real guts of the engine. So you had to, had to replace that and start over. And the guy selling it, he, he said, well, he was really pressing me to go, 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 uh, go, still go for that with only about four days left there. To, and I said, Bill, every time I did that with the dragster and raced to the left, Put it to the last minute. I did something dumb and d didn't succeed. He, I won't repeat his exact language, but he, uh, like, darn it, you're, you're, you're right. So we agreed to do a buy-off on a dynamometer where you test an engine out of the car and uh, uh, get that. Well, it, for him, it was an actual, absolutely lucky thing that we tested there uh, on the, uh, there. But again, another appropriate date, June 13th. Friday the 13th, July 13th. We assembled the engine to run the oil, and then the oil pressure problem. It would go get up to oil pressure, and then as it got up to speed, it'd drop way off. Well, it turns out the, uh, there, there was the oil pickup had physically broken off inside. If we'd have run that at El Mirage, it would have completely broken the engine. It would have, no, no question, it would have put, put it was a bad, bad event when rods go through the, the crankcase. That's what would have happened. So we, we, we looked at it and said, no, we're not going to do that. Let's get back. We, we rebuilt the engine, new oil pump, new pan, and we, we got up to 626 horsepower. I'll comment a little more on that later, but uh, that was that was a lot better than 400 that, that we had before, and it, importantly, it had oil pressure. So Bonneville Salt Flies Racing started in about a week. So again, this was amazing. I look back on that and I can't believe I did it. All these things that had to come together. The crew, you can't go, can't do this alone. Uh, had to get driver suit, helmet, gloves, boots, all this. Uh, truck, tow truck, trailer, mobile generator and such. I didn't have any of that in November when I started out. So I had to get all that mass together. The system problem there. And of course you had to train, change, change that. Couldn't have UCLA colors on there. So that, uh, be sort of sort of like having Florida cut colors here, huh? No, nah, it doesn't work. Okay, and then so then here here's I say most expensive suit. Then uh, that was a suit I, I got rather quickly because it was available. A, a ni nice, great color to be out there in the salt, right? Black, but it was available, so I, I, I got it. And it was I will t more about it later. An, an interesting view is. Here, here was a guy that was my crew chief. He's, you can see the, ca the tattoos and all, and a Harley kind of guy. And you think, man, this bearded old, old guy. But I, I found him inadvertently, but it turns out he, he was really a man for all seasons. He passed away a couple, few years ago here, but he, he was, had a PhD from USC in, in uh, chemical engineering. He was also on the football team. So uh, we hit it off real well. And that was just a coincidence. I happened to meet him and got him involved in it. But as you would see him, you think, boy, here's, these guys can't be. And unfortunately, you see an awful lot of them have, have gray hair and so on. But uh, we're going to do it. OK, so August 9th, everything came together. The truck, car, trailer. And about 1 AM, we left for Bonneville. And intentionally left some things 
none that we could put up there. We didn't have the decals on the car or anything like that. So here, th this is a picture that gives you some idea of what it's like out there. Here's, here's the car w with its proper color scheme. And you, you, the sun is a real enemy. Even though when, when it's not hot, you get a double reflection. Because it, it, it's like when you have snow or water or something like that, and you get and you can get sunburned in funny places. So it, uh, it it's really intense. So you have umbrellas and protect from that. Oh, also, I had to had to buy a truck. This is, a, this is my diesel truck. That and this car can't can't start from the line by itself. It has an automatic transmission without a torque converter. So you can start the engine, but then you have to push it up to about 40 miles an hour, and then, then you put it in gear. It, it outruns the, the tow truck pretty fast then. But that, that was waiting for the first run to get an idea here. We set off. So the, the first run had to be a licensing run. And that, so the two were, first time I ever drove the car was 137 and changed 138 miles an hour. August 13th, and then the second run was 181. You're supposed to not, not have over 175, and they said, well, we call that a whoops. It's closer, because you don't have a speedometer. You just have a tack. So six miles an hour reading a tack is uh, pretty close. They, they said, okay, that's a whoops. Well, it's okay. So then the, the next day, here's the first, first run. I made over 200, so that was in my goal, remember? Yeah, so th that wasn't very exciting then. You said, gee, this, this thing will go a lot faster than that. Uh, so uh, so made, August 15th, we made one, one run with top speed of 206 miles an hour. And you can tell what, with a rear engine car, you, you, it's hard to tell what's going on. But I pick, ended up picking up a piece of glass in the right rear tire. And so it was going flat and got into a poor area of the salt at the same time. Well, the inexperience, I turned out just a little too fast. So what happens when you turn out too fast? Whoops, the car spins. So that was only 206 miles an hour. So that was uh, the funny part of it. It spun just once, and then it en ended up pointed right at the, the return road. So the guy comes out there to the safety car, and he says, boy, that was good driving. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it was what, flat out luck. But, but, but it, if you get a compliment, take it. So anyway, kind of poor, turned out it broke the canopy, so racing was over. Uh, and w once you spin a car, then you, you've got a bunch of things to check out too. The, the all, all the particularly the bearings on the front end, or and so on. You, so that that was the end. Okay, lessons learned. Need to improve the driver visibility of the car. It was it laid down pretty flat, and I basically couldn't see out of it. So I got back to Bill, Bill Summers. I bought it from. I said, Bill can't see out of that car. And he said, yeah, people have complained about that through the years. <laughs> and, and of course, I explained to him, I have a brother eight years younger than me. He's driven top fuel dragsters and this kind of thing. And his statement to it, he says, well, the view from a race car is vastly overstated. But he's, he's driven the dr dr drag race. Uh, but back in the 70s, he was going 250 miles an hour and a quarter mile. It was just, that was kind of fast. And uh, so, so, so I, I didn't believe that. I, I raced it five inches. And everybody says, well, you're going to slow it down. Got more wind resistance. I said, yeah, I'm, I want to see. I'm an old guy. I'm going to see. Okay. Lessons of the salt are kind of interesting because your human reactions are absolutely wrong. You naturally, if you have a problem on the freeway, what do you do? Or on the road? What, hit the brakes? Yeah, get off the gas. Hit the brakes. It's wrong out there. You pop the chute. And then, th th then you stop. If you... If you hit the brakes first, you can spin the, spin the car. So pop the chute and drive, drive into the chute. It doesn't have a speedometer to help you. Okay, so we raised the cage, allow for vision. Uh, had to do the sheet metal over. So everything from the belly pants up to the sheet metal, we, we've, we have changed just so we can do that. Uh, then we started fitting it into the the program a little bit there at SC. We had a wind tunnel at that point, so two aerospace and mechanical engineering students did their senior project, redesigned the canopy. Remember, we broke the canopy, so we had to build a new one. And there were all kinds of alternatives you could do. There were very expensive ones and very inexpensive ones. They checked it out for the Reynolds numbers we were running. It was You couldn't tell the difference. It was in the noise of the data, the difference. So, so 
what did I do? I went the cheap way, right? Okay, did, and it worked. But anyway, they got, got them, them through, and the, the wind tunnel broke down a couple of times, and it's gone now. The guy that did the research there is retired, so it's gone. Intended to run again in 2008 at Delmarise, didn't, didn't make it to that. And considering additional trade-offs, like in 2008, uh, here, here again a picture of it out in salt, the, the crew that you, you assemble, and the, the, the one, I think that's him, the one, anyway, the one, the one guy was from Boeing, and he took, he took several classes from me, so he got interested in going to Bonneville, and he was on the crew with, with me for a couple of years, then he built his own roadster, and he's been up, there, been up there racing ever since, so that was kind of a success story and a second generation, uh, a fun one for me. Okay, August 19, 2008, attempted one run, and the engine started okay. Couldn't, with a rear engine car, you can't tell what's going on. Well, I just quit. No, no explosion or anything, it just quit going. I thought, well, probably had a wire come loose or something like that. Well, it turns out uh, the engine, in fact, had, had broken the timing chain. And when you, it's an interference engine. You break the timing chain, boom, pistons and valves intersect. So we, we could right away tell there was, hey, there's some, some serious problem. And then we got all the analyses. Everybody had a theory of why it failed. What failed first? Well, we, 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 quick analysis there, you could pull a spark, spark plug and see a, a spark plug hammered down. So you say, that, this is not a good sign. Well, it turns out that they, they did inter intersect, it ruined the head, and uh, significant damage there. So we, we then set about a, a trade-off study, again, system marketing. We said, oh, I'm, I'm tired of that old engine. It was kind of a collection of junk he had, to be honest. And, so we said, well, let's, let's look at it. So the, the, again, the SAE student, same student I talked about, built his own roadster. He did a term project where we had a life cycle cost a course in systems engineering over there. He, he took that course and he found out I was in, interested in that. So he's, he did a, a project in that and went through kind of the, the cost trade-off analysis, life cycle cost, all these alternatives. And of course I had to, he interviewed me, and we got, he, I got bu budgets and so on, and he, he then made a recommendation, and then as the customer, I could do what? I could alter the, the specs, and maybe I paid more, more for the engine than I gave him in the initial specs. It kind of go, goes up. So I bought a brand new engine, a ra ra racing engine, built for that purpose, uh, down in uh, Fort Worth uh, area, and so, uh, actually Arlington, right, right close to you. UT there, and anyway, uh, decided to buy the new engine, planned to drive it at El Mirage, didn't, didn't make it to that. But now you can see corporate growth, right? You see we've got more, more, more crew members and all in a variety of roles, including the, the second tallest one in there. He's only 6'2", he's my youngest son. So the next tender, deal was to talk grandma into him being able to drive it. Uh, me driving, you know, that, that's disposable property, but <laughs> a, 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 a son with grandkids and all this, she, she wasn't, so fi finally, did they get her to agree on that, but you know, not easily. 2009, made, made eight runs, most we ever made, got up to 247, top, top speed for so far. And to give you an idea, at Bonneville, at any given time, I, I just sampled, took one sample one day. That day that I did 247, there were 140 cars. I ignored motorcycles. And there were 11 that went faster than me out of that 140. So I was getting, getting towards the upper end of it that way. But remember, uh, the top one went 400. So the difference between uh, 247 and 400 is amazing. It's millions of dollars of difference. So anyway, that's the idea of it. Uh, here's a picture of it. Actually, it was taken at speed. A photographer happened to be out there and, and caught that uh, clean run. So then, another aspect, I, I said, hmm, our, our dean, remembers Giannis, he, 
we were, we were in a meeting, we had a, a bunch of people from Northrop Grumman in, there was a meeting talking to them. The dean says, you know, our, our regular tenure track faculty, 40% of their effort is to go into research of their own choosing. I said, oh. <laughs> so that's now a research vehicle. And I labeled my garage in Tempe as a research area, research lab. And so, anyway, but then I started, got the crazy idea of teaching systems engineering, kind of the reverse of the usual process. We usually t say, well, here's the principles, now I'll follow this and go down and do something. So let's, let's do something that's a little different. Let's, let's look at the real experiment that's going on and then look backwards, if you will. What, what's going on here? How do we learn from it? So I need to say, uh, Students loved it. I offered it about 10 times over there. And started out, I had a book called uh, The Physics of NASCAR. I don't know if any of you happen to see that. This part of the country, NASCAR is a little more popular than it is in Southern California. And, and so I had to, Leslie Pilecki was a, actually a physicist at, at that time, UT Dallas. And she'd written this book. I thought, boy, this is, this is what we want. I never found a single student at uh, <laughs> USC was interested in NASCAR. So we, we migrated to be interested in, in following Formula One and study what the professionals do. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a professional, certainly at those levels, but when you follow Formula One, it's phenomenal what goes on there. And it's a continual battle with all the politics and, and so on, but the money is un insane and they're, they're they fight the, the haves, want, want, they don't want any, any budget constraints. And the haves are names like Ferrari, Mercedes, uh, Red Bull have been the, and they say, boy, we're gonna budget it, we're not gonna play. Well, so you got all, you got all the politics of anything going on anywhere. And so we, we ended up following it and we, we respected all, all kinds of uh, forms of motorsports and a requirement of the class was you had to attend one live motorsports event and report on it based on the content of the class. So that doesn't mean just tee hee hee. And of course, Southern California you got all kinds of events. Drag racing is uh, both in the spring and the fall or the beginning and ending ones for that at, at Pomona. So uh, that was pretty good duty. We'd get a bunch of them, they'd be getting credit for a class, I'd be credit for teaching the class and we'd have our, our lab session was to go out to Pomona and watch races. And if you haven't been around those, these top fuelers and all, they, they go zero to over 300 miles an hour in 1,000 feet. And, and do that in less than four seconds. So you talk about G-forces, they're phenomenal. And you have to work backwards. There's no dynamometer that'll test those, but you have to work backwards. And they're estimating now that they've broken through 10,000 horsepower in one car with an engine that's not very big, but running nitromethane and just putting out tremendous power. So anyway, uh, ha ha we had fun doing it. We, uh, there, there was a learning again from systems. And most of them, with all due respect, came into thinking a si race car system was a car and driver. Uh, that's only the start. And particularly when you get into the big money thing, the, the advertising and all this, that's a big deal. NASCAR, why do you see the whole thing st covered with stickers? Those people are sponsorship, right? And they want, they want their name. That's a billboard. It's so, uh, uh, really a business. Formula One's the same, same, same crazy one. Learn from the professionals. I, I made it clear I'm not one. And then an organization called the International Council on System Engineering. I got very involved in that when I was running the system architect and the engineering program. And they had a motorsports working group there. A, a, a group of them wanted to create a generic syllabus for systems engineering and using motorsports. Well, I'm not a generic guy. I said, I'll help you some on that, but I'm going to go do my own thing. Uh, that, that generic syllabus never, never even got done. And meanwhile, I'd offered the course about 10 times. So. Uh, that, that's kind of my orientation. Let's go do something. It may not be perfect, but it ended up, again, here's uh, 2010, the crew here. Uh, we, we, we went to Bonneville, three, three runs. Uh, that was the highest speed. 
263, that's what you uh, saw in the picture. And again, and it spun there. And in, in seven seconds, it spun seven times. And midway through, the I had popped the parachute in probably t about two tenths of a second, too late. So it, it came out, that caught it, and when it caught the tail, what did it do? It whipped it the other way. So in, in seven seconds, you had spun seven times and, and, and drew G's, about, about 3.6 G's spinning like that, two different directions, and I, I had a little, little bruise on a knuckle. So that, that's a goodness thing. You, your, your wife doesn't think so when she's out there. But uh, this is what went, went on. We got the high speed. Uh, everyone said, well, you need a wing on there to, for downforce. We, we got into it, and again, this guy from Boeing took, took apart the data, and we determined it was oversteering. You don't want to, you barely turn the steering wheel, and somehow it had two. Uh, gear reduction boxes in the steering, and somewhere in the process, and I think it was before I got the car, one of those had gotten reversed. So it was a one-to-one -one ratio, go, where it should have been a 2.25 by having those in series, 1.5 each. And man, we, 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 we changed those, and it, it just made a complete different car to drive because you could control it. You couldn't the other, because you, you basically don't, don't turn. And it's a, a little different. So that's... That's how we got, got to that position again, uh, and just happened to have a photographer down there. It wasn't somebody who was with us, happened to be down at the four mile mark where it spun and caught that. So that's, that's unusual to have, particularly there. Okay, what then? Had to repair the canopy, we broke it, and it spun. Had to, everyone agreed, oh, we need a wing on there, but then, then we found out that the, really the steering was pro probably more of the problem than the wing, but the wing, the wing does give you some ground force. We, we obviously use it the opposite for what a wing usually is for, for lift. We, we have it negative. We only have about a one degree negative, and that puts tremendous down for us. But then, you, you, interestingly enough, you've got to add, add weight, and it's counterintuitive. You've got to add weight in the front because you want the weight, the CG in front of the CP. So anyway, 2011, here, here's the wing in place. It's kind of hard to see with that mountain in the background, but it's a... Uh, out there, made seven runs, uh, tried two others. Steering made it just a complete different deal. But we, we had minor problems all week, and uh, t turns out we had a had an e engine problem. Uh, so, uh, so, so we we had to do several things for the for the next year, 2012. We changed the air in the duct. Anybody know what a knock duct is? It, it, they're used for, kind of for an aircraft for air inlet with a, kind of the minimum drag for, for typically secondary cooling. We, we had a, a knock duct designed for the air inlet and the guy had actually designed it wrong. He, and, and we found, found out once, once I got around a guy by the name Mark Page was our, came in as a guest lecturer. I said, My, Mark, this doesn't seem right. He says, well, it's not. You're right. <laughs> and so we redesigned that. Actually, I had my picture in Hot Rod Magazine, that fine research journal, uh, with, with that knock duct and pointing out that that's wrong. So anyway, we, we, we found uh, electrical problems. We had to chase down and then had to re redo the car. My son, uh, we had grandma's permission now, and that's important. And he, he's a little bigger, six foot two and about 220 pounds or so. And, and it, so it required a new driving suit, an old one. W w wouldn't reach, so we we bought one that would fit him. It, it, I, I'm I'm lost in it, but it, it it actually works better than I thought it would. And the dr driving suit again was by far the most expensive suit I've ever owned. It's over three thousand dollars for a driving suit for just a hobby. <laughs> My wife didn't know I was doing that either, but but I explained to her, hey, hey that's that's your that's your son. Now. Oh yeah, okay, good idea. Anyway, pl planned to. Race. We changed it. They ran the wing on all eight runs. Top speed was only 240, and we, we had to unravel the problems. Uh, 2013, we made five runs. Uh, I, I was going to drive once he kind of got oriented. He got his licensing runs done. He got to 245, and then he, 
he, of all things, he ran into a chunk of aluminum. It was a big block like that. And, and even though you think, well, you can see that. Well, if, if you're down that low and you're moving that fast, you're covering a mile in about 14 seconds. And you, so it, it, it's really uh, quite deceiving. So he, he hit that, it hit, hit the rear tire, and you can see the, the G-forces to the side were un, completely unusual. So that's what happened. It spun it. Uh, it spun out, again, damaged the canop canopy, and then technology takes over. Here, he's he down there and he had, his, he had his cell phone with him. So he's texting, he's texting me to say, I'm, I spun the car, Dad, I'm okay. <laughs> Need to say, the safety guy comes up and he says, what are you doing? <laughs> he told him, they, they weren't used to that. You're, you're down, we were five miles away. You, and so it takes a while to get down there. We don't go quite as fast in that pickup truck. So anyway, that, that it spun out, damaged the canopy. It didn't hurt, didn't hurt him. And rats, I didn't get a turn to drive. So uh, 2014, what happened then? Well, another variable out there. If you go out there today, the, the, the salt flats are covered with water and that has to dry up. And that's what naturally levels it. We, we don't grade it, we just drag them bars across there and the level it. Well, the weather delivered about 12 inches of water on the salt and meat was canceled. We left the car up in Ely, Nevada. That's about 120 miles away. There's a guy that has a shop up there. I can leave it. So we went back up for another meet in uh, late, late September and that, that one was canceled also. So what did we do in 2015? Hmm, same thing we did in 2014. Got rained out. Uh, so the good news is we didn't break any parts. The bad news is we didn't go, get to go racing. We considered running in uh, El Mirage Dry Lake there at the end of the year, but it, that didn't work out. Uh, second second day, day of the meet was canceled due to wind, and it's a dirty, dusty area. I drove it one time, and, and the dust would get inside that closed cockpit. I couldn't even see the tack. So, so I didn't. I didn't go fast. I just went about 108 miles an hour or something like that, just tooling through, which for that car is not not fast. So uh, consider running there, but uh, didn't do that. 2016. Well, we're we're hoping to run. The forecast isn't real positive, but you, you get Mother Nature involved. Uh, had to update the fire extinguisher bottles, replace the seat belts because you know, they're time limited. Not very optimistic. And it turns out, we knew the rainfall was a problem, but what's more concerning is that it turns out it's, it's, it's an underground aquifer that would, would feed the salt from underneath that would f form this crust. And that's drying up, apparently. Now, you got a bunch of amateur people predicting the weather, and one guy, uh, they, get, they got all kinds of theories about the axis of the earth and how it's moving and what the weather's going to do and so on. So we, we don't know. We're, we're hoping to run, obviously. We're, We'll be ready. The car, car's ready uh, over in Arizona. Questions? Well, I compressed about a three-hour talk and got it done in an hour. Let me, uh, I've got a couple other pictures to give you an idea what. And I have a question. You give the speeds to four, six significant figures. How is the speed actually measured? Okay, they they, they have markers. Yeah, they have, they have, they they have uh, electric electric eyes that that sense it there, and, and it, it supposedly they give you the speed down to uh, three decimal points. Anybody believe that that's true? <laughs> a bunch of a bunch of amateurs, but it it comes out. But I, I can. I can tell pretty well from the tack, and it, it correlates pretty well. And I have I have data acquisition in the car, so when I spun it and said it was the official speed for that whole mile was 263, my instantaneous speed was 266. And so I have data acquisition in there. And you think, well, you don't need that, but it's it it, it really does help. So, so you're really measuring to one percent? Is that what you? Well, I. Yeah, you, you get into calculating what that third decimal point says uh, in your talk. <laughs> very small difference. I, and it's, it's all done by amateurs, but they, they're very consistent at least. And 
Uh, it, seem, seems to, it seems to work. Let me. We have time for a few more questions. Any? Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I like questions. That's usually where we learn. Man in blue. And I'm, I reserve the right to say I don't know. So, like, uh, you mentioned you're running, uh, like, a couple runs. So, the aerodynamic effects more or the engine output effects more? The final result. Like, which one is more important? The, the aerodynamics or? Yeah, or the engine output. Engine output. Well, they're clearly, they clearly work together with each other. And one thing that's kind of counterintuitive, and the, the, the question, I need to repeat it for the distance people. The, the question was, uh, which is more important, the aerodynamics or uh, other features in the car for speed? It turns out, for that kind of racing, weight isn't a, isn't a big disadvantage. So you can add weight for downforce, yeah. and, and you also can add aerodynamics. So it's a, it's a trade-off between the two. And you want the weight distributed differently than intuitive. You think, well, boy, I want weight in the back. That's going to be where the traction is. That'll, that's what will make it squirrely because it's, it's behind the center. You have the center of gravity behind the center of pressure. And if, if you do that, it's, it's, it's working against you. So, yeah, we had a, had a number of things we had to figure out that weren't, weren't intuitive. Had, of all things, it had independent suspension on it when I first got it. And you don't need independent suspension unless you're going to turn. And it was actually working against us because it was, it was doing some of this. So we got rid of that. So we complete. Qu another question. Do you think the the addition of the wing uh, hurt the performance in the end because you didn't go yes. as fast? Well, yeah, there were there, there were other reasons that, but, but clearly it won't. There's some drag that you're introducing. Great question. Uh, again, the question was, do, you, do I think the wing hurt the performance? Yes, it did. There were other things going on beside that. So if any of us had a design of experiments class and you say, well, how, how many things can you run? Well, we've I've been racing. We've made uh, a total of only about 25 real runs. And a real run is at least 200 miles an hour. Uh, that's not much data when you've got all these variables you can tick off. All, all the things you can do in the engine, and and we had had the, the one engine and the racing engine. So somebody didn't set the valves right, it didn't didn't tighten them, so it it, it caused a problem. Last question. Another another question. Last one. Okay, last question. Would it be advantageous to test the car in a wind tunnel before you even take it out racing? Uh, would it be yes? The question was, would it be advantageous to get the car in a wind tunnel and and test it. Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, if you get a wind tunnel big enough to put the car in, uh, you, you, you think that costs much money? And, and, and wind tunnels are a dying species right now because the, the, all, all the computer simulations of it are getting better and better and better. They're still not as good, but the CFD kinds of things are are just driving them out of business, but uh, Formula One, who has very high budgets, they and they have to carefully limit how much wind tunnel time they can get. But you're talking a $300 million a year budget for two cars. Uh, that's a little above my level. So, so I, and I don't, I don't really know of a, a wind tunnel I could get access to that fit, fit the whole car and don't have that kind of money. But it's a great question. It, CFD still hasn't caught up with wind tunnels, but it's it getting better and better and better. But it's, but it's also how good is your CFD model that you're putting in there? And, and you, there's little things that are very fine points. If you're on those kind of speeds that make a, di a difference, that you, you really can't get in that model. So, I, okay, that's. Dr. Settles will be available offline for. Do you have any further? Oh yeah, I have it, and I have. I have my fun, fun business cards here. It has a picture on the back of it. If you want one, take it. Uh, the only thing that's not accurate, I'm Professor Emeritus now. That's, that's the best title, so <laughs> along with Grandpa. So I have a question for you. Has anybody gone faster than 263 miles per hour on wheels? All right. So it's fair to say we have the fastest man on wheels here. <laughs> and I must confess also, I think he's the fastest man the fastest faculty on wheels. <laughs> Sam, would you agree? So with that, there, there, there's one down at U of A. There's a, a Bonner Denton, 
head's going 301 or something like that. Oh, so, he's the second fastest, but I don't know what I'm factored to. Uh, yeah, but, anyway. but, he, but he, he's got a one where you can streamline around Stand, the car. So. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And fun. please thank accept this whole well, talk. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Wait. So, here we go. And I think it's almost going to match the color of your car. Well, I'm sorry, we're going to have a. You're gonna have the orange from uh, okay. the U. Oh, <laughs> that works. Thank you, Stan. Thank, Thank you, Mike.